script readings. Luke 12, 49. They have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No. I tell you about division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so today's message, continuing that theme of difficult sayings of, of Jesus, is um, it's well. I'll put it this way: this message today is a uh, it's a straight gospel message. Jesus, what Jesus is doing here is preparing his disciples for. The gospel, and it, it has bearing on um, something I think we know. We know this is what the gospel does, but also something we don't want to admit the gospel does when we share it with people. And so what Jesus is really talking about here is his purpose in coming. And we all, often get the kind of the pat answer, you know, why did Jesus come to earth? Well, to die for our sins, which is absolutely, unequivocally correct. But that's not all he came to do. And he explains in this passage what the full... Uh, uh, pathway looks like when the gospel is preached in its fullness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and, uh, and tackle this, this passage where he says a number of things that are very difficult to uh, accept and understand. Let's, let's pray. Father, we are here because um, as we always pray, God, you are here. We, we are gathered as, as your people in this place because you are worthy of, of worship. Now, though we are a small number today, it, it, it doesn't really matter, God, because whether you are worshipped by one or by thousands, uh, the point is we are called as individuals to give glory to you. That's part of what we're called to do. And God, we want to do that by being attentive to your word. There's no greater respect that we can show anyone by truly listening to what they have to say. And so, God, we want to listen to your word, not only because they come from you, because you promise that in them there is life. And God, we want, to be, we want to be changed. We want to find life in your words today, God. So inspire us and encourage us, but God, uh, tune our hearts to be fully um, aligned to worship you, who you are, and, and as you reveal yourself to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And so again, this passage here, as Jesus begins to uh, talk about a number of things as he approaches the day when he'll go to the cross, uh, people are beginning to wonder what's going on. Because remember, Jesus had large crowds following him. And the more and more he preaches the truth, the more and more those crowds shrink. And his disciples are beginning to wonder, what's going on here? Why all the opposition to the message? Why, why are people becoming, uh, are being estranged rather than brought together? Because in their understanding, again, the Messiah is supposed to bring peace and unity and is supposed to gather a large crowd of people around them and, and begin the new kingdom. And what they're seeing is the exact opposite, that the crowds are getting smaller, and people that are truly following Jesus are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so they're wondering, why is there division happening when we expect people to respond in a, in a more positive way? And Jesus begins to explain that here. So he explains his purpose in coming as he defines it, number one, he came to cast fire. And he says this in verse 49. I have come, this is why he came, I have come to bring fire on earth. And notice his passion, how I wish that it was already kindled. So his purpose was to bring fire upon the earth, so much so that he is desiring that it would happen right now, and it happened right away, but it hasn't. So Jesus plainly states his mission is to cast fire. But we have to understand, what did Jesus mean when he says he wants to cast fire? What does it mean by fire? What is he looking forward to? Well, again, there's a number of ideas going around. Um, 
with this. The first one is the fire represents the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Remember when the Holy Spirit came, fire settled on the top of the head. So he's saying, I wish, can't wait till the, the Holy Spirit comes. I'm kind of the inaugural person. I'm going to come and preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit's going to come. And so the fire that he's talking about is the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's one idea. The other is the uh, idea that it refers to the preaching of the gospel. That as the gospel pre preached, it kind of comes upon the earth with this power like fire going through a forest it just kind of takes away everything that's past but the gospel is going to change the world that's kind of the second idea that idea refers to persecution or trouble that Jesus is you know talking about that that the the persecution of the church is going to happen he wished that the church would be established so that that process could begin it would it would accompany the preaching of the gospel if the church would be persecuted and the final idea is that it refers to judgment right that He's saying that he, he's come to bring judgment. He can't wait till that judgment comes. And so fire, by the way, in Scripture can have all those illusions, right? It can have all those meanings in Scripture. Every time you read the word fire, it probably means, in the New Testament at least, it means one of those things. So when we have a word that can mean many things, make me proud now, how do we decide what the word means? Context. Context. Get that woman, a washer and dryer, <laughs> new washer and dryer. Yes, context. What does the context say? The context will always give you the meaning of the word. So in the context of Luke 12, uh, that should have the, I, the, the context of the word fire means here. Jesus has been talking about over and over and over again the coming judgment, that judgment would come. He talks about judgment in, in verses 58 and 59. In chapter 13, he talks about it. Uh, John the Baptist previously warned the people about the wrath to come, that, that people who don't produce will be thrown into the fire. Uh, John predicted that the Messiah would baptize people in fire. And he warned the Messiah would bring this uh, fire that would, would uh, burn away the, the chafe and this unquenchable fire. So Jesus has talked about judgment, 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 using the word fire to refer to judgment. He didn't really change his mind here. Right? He's talking about the same thing. I can't wait until I can bring that judgment that I've just been talking about on earth. And so with this in mind, the predominant theme that Jesus is talking about is judgment. And so it's really a hard saying because he says, I've come to bring judgment upon the earth, and I can't wait until that judgment happens. We don't usually see Jesus in that light. We want, can't wait for mercy and grace to be poured out. But here's the thing. While Jesus came to seek and save the lost, that was his primary mission, his ministry also resulted in judgment of those who reject him. You can't have salvation without judgment of those who reject him. So the very nature of what Jesus came to do to seek and save the lost, those lost who don't respond to him, the result is judgment. Not only judgment for their sins, but also judgment for the rejection of Christ. Uh, we, uh, as Christians, I know we love to remove this idea of judgment from the gospel. But judgment stubbornly remains a part of the gospel message. If you don't respond to Jesus, there is judgment. There is this inevitable division that will come when we preach the gospel. People have to choose when the truth of the gospel is presented to them. Paul puts that so clear in 2 Corinthians 2, this is verses 14 and 15. He says this, Thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal possession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. That would be great if it stopped just there, right? This is what we're called to spread the aroma of Christ. This is a blessing everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma that brings death, judgment, right? People reject. To the other, an aroma that brings life. Who is equal to such a task? Who has the power to go out and preach the gospel that will bring life to some and curse to others? That's what we do with the gospel. Sobering thought, isn't it? Every person we speak to, they come to a decision. If we present the truth of the gospel, there is a decision that they are on the cusp of. Well, if they choose Christ, they choose life. If they reject him, they've chosen death. They've chosen judgment. It's the same choice we made. Chose life or chose death. 
Which brings us to the second purpose that Jesus came for, right? The one we all talk about. Jesus came to bear sin. He came to bring judgment, a, a, a natural result of preaching the gospel, and he came to bear sin. So verse 50 says, but before that happens, right? But before that happens, I have a baptism to undergo. And what constraint or what kind of pressure I am under until it is completed. So the means by which this fire would be cast on the earth was by the cross. That's how it would start, by the message, of, uh, by the cross being completed, and now the way of salvation is made clear. Now there is a choice. Will I follow after this Messiah, or will I follow after myself? Will I choose life, or will I choose death? Will I choose mercy and, and a, a righteousness that is given to me, or will I choose to go on my own and pay my own debt? That is the choice. And so when Jesus speaks of this baptism he's about to undergo, he, he is referring to the cross. It's the idea of being immersed under the flood of God's full wrath. When Jesus went on the cross um, to redeem us, it distressed him, not because of a crucifixion. That was the least of his worries, really. Uh, it distressed him because he would bear the sin of the world, the penalty of the judgment for all of our sin, for everyone who has lived, was placed upon him. Millions and millions of, of sin debt was placed upon his shoulders. So the greatest agony of the cross was the reality of the sinless one, the one who never committed one sin to become the sin bearer. And the fire of judgment that would be cast, that he predicted, that he couldn't wait for, would first fall on him as he bore our sin. So the, the, the first judgment that was poured out was poured out at the cross. Now there's a choice. We can take that payment or no. we can bear it on our own. Sorry. The penalty for sin is death. It's all right, Chris, no problem. Yeah. Uh, the, the penalty for our sin is eternal separation from this holy God. And we all know the story, right? God cannot ignore it because because he is holy. There has to be a penalty. Uh, there has to be some sort of sacrifice to satisfy God's perfect justice and holiness. And, um, and God, in his grace and his mercy, made a way that that penalty would be inflicted on one rather than on all. And so we have a choice. And so through the cross, God can now be both just and and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's an amazing thing he has done. This is from Romans 3.26. This was also to demonstrate his righteousness, God's righteousness in the present time, so that he would be just. Justice was fulfilled by someone bearing the penalty of the world and the justifier of the one who lives because of Jesus' faithfulness. So through the cross, God's justice is satisfied, and he can also justify those who have no way to pay their own debt. He did both through the cross. And so again, inevitably, we have that, that choice of life or death, the penalty um, that would bring about uh, separation from God or restoration to God. So because of this mercy, and this is kind of, I think, where the disconnect is for us, at least for me when I, when I share the gospel, because... I've experienced the mercy, and I've experienced the grace of God. So you would think that every person would be quick to embrace that, right? You just think, why wouldn't, why, why wouldn't everybody want to accept Jesus, right? And take that, you know, get away from the separation of God, right? And, and, get, and be free. And why wouldn't people receive Christ? Why, why do they choose not to? And so while many receive Christ and find mercy, right, like many of us here today, Many other people reject God's offer. Why? Because it offends their pride. That's the base reason why people reject Jesus. It offends them. It offends people, their pride. Uh, they don't want to admit that they're sinners deserving of judgment. People want to think they're okay. And it offends them when we come to them and say, you need to repent. I don't need to repent. Why do I need to repent of? I'm not bad. Right? I'm good. Right? But the reality is, they're not and neither are you and I. They, they, they don't want to admit that they can do nothing to atone for their own sins. People love to think that they can do good, and the balance will weigh out, and God will say, oh, you're a really good person. You can be coming to heaven. 
right? That people really want. And when we tell them that's not the way, there's one way, it offends their pride. So the cross is a stumbling block, and there is, with a stumbling block, there is this inevitable division that happens where people become violent to a, to a point of violence and persecution when they hear that if you don't accept Jesus, you will be judged. That's not my message. That's not your message. That's the Lord's message, right? That's his determination. And people stand with pride and say, I want to believe me. I reject God's angle on this. I like my angle better. And everyone has the right to do that, to remain and pay the debt on your own. But trust me, you don't want to pay the debt on your own. And so Jesus says that because of the way the gospel brings life and death, there, and because people are offended by the gospel and it becomes a stumbling block to people, that inevitably there will be people who choose God's mercy and there will be people who reject it. And that, that choice will eventually come to a point of dividing people even to the point of dividing family members from one another. Clo the closest relationships you can think of, because of the gospel, will be divided if you choose Jesus or reject Jesus. And so that's the third point that Jesus makes. You need to understand what's at stake here, Jesus says. My coming will result in division. My coming is not going to result in peace. It's going to result in division. Verse 51 do you think I came to bring peace on earth? Because that was the prevailing thought. All the Jews thought he came to bring peace on the whole earth, right? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there'll be five in one family divided against each other. The idea of five is it's not an equal. It's going to be unbalanced, right? You get it three against two, that type of thing. Father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Take, take your relationship. Families will be divided over the gospel. And so Jesus states, I did not come to bring peace, but rather division. As the gospel is preached, what you will see is division. You will see clear lines drawn between the people of God and people who reject <laughs> Jesus. Again, the prevailing idea was the Messiah would bring peace. After all, the angels came on Christmas, right? Peace on earth, right? Yeah. Finish it. Good, good, no, no. To those who all eat. Right, right. You, uh, you all King James here. Go different, right? Peace on earth. <laughs> no. uh, most manuscripts say peace on earth to those who find God's favor, right? So is it peace on earth to everyone? No, it's not. Right? It, it, um, Jesus went around giving peace to individuals. I grant you peace, you disciples. I give you peace. Nowhere in the scripture is there a promise that, there, that Jesus, by the coming, will bring peace on earth until the second coming when everything comes to a, a halting stop and, and there's a new heavens and new earth. So God's peace is extended only to those who respond favorably to Jesus. Again, not my gospel, his gospel. Those who refuse to God's offer of peace remain his enemies. Again, this is the gospel message, the stuff that we don't like talking about. A person who has not given themselves to Jesus, has not received Christ, is God's enemy. They are against God because they are trusting some other idol, whatever it might be. Those who are, Jesus made it clear, this is chapter 11, verse 23, that if you are not for me, you are against me. There is no middle road. There is no neutral ground. The, the offer of the gospel will necessarily divide people into two opposing camps. And as time goes on, in our culture now, we see it slowly happening, right? Mm -hmm. How Christianity is being maligned, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's not because they all say, well, Christianity doesn't do good things. The culture knows that Christianity does, does good things, right? We start hospitals and we do schools. That's not what they have a problem with. They have a problem with, your message offends me. You're saying, I'm bad. I want to be good on my own. And the gospel clearly says, you're not good. No one is good. You need a savior. I need a savior. Choose who you're going to follow. And so Jesus used this illustration. It's really from Micah 7, 6 to show that, that there are divisions that will be caused by the gospel so deep 
even to the separation of church family of, of family members, close family members, church family members. This is Micah seven six. For a son thinks his father is a fool, a daughter challenges her mother, and a daughter-in-law, her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are his own family. And again, so Jesus takes that prediction from the Micah, the prophet Micah, and he, he, he applies it to his own ministry. And the fact here, Jesus does not apologize. He goes, I'm sorry about that. That's kind of a result of the gospel. You didn't really want that to happen. Um, you know, I'm sorry about it. He doesn't apologize at all. He just states it clearly as can be. The gospel caused divisions. Deal with it. It's basically what he's saying. It's what's going to happen. See, here's the reason. Because he is the eternal son of God, we must follow him. Uh, even if it leads to family division. Because he is so much more worthy than any of our other allegiances, even our family, even our closest of ties. Do we believe that? Yes. I, I think the church does it sometimes. Uh, throughout my ministry, I've seen churchgoers, people who love Jesus, compromise for their families, left and right. They compromise for the, the sake of the gospel, and, they, and let me tell you something. In my experience, it never helps them. It will not draw them to the gospel. In fact, what it does... It sets up other idols in their lives that they follow. Right. When we appease our family, try to say, oh, I don't want to cause trouble. I don't want to cause turmoil in my family. So I'm just going to compromise some of my beliefs, do a little soft Christianity here. It will, it will not draw your family to Jesus. It will actually push them away from Jesus because you've set up another idol, whatever that compromise is, is now an idol that they will worship at. Because you have not exalted Jesus... For I have not exalted Jesus to the place that he deserves, above everything else. There is nothing that deserves more allegiance in our lives, including our spouses, our children, our families, than Jesus. And when we lower the bar for them, we do not do them a service. We push them away from Jesus because we're trying to stop the division that naturally happens with the gospel. You will divide your family with the gospel. If you stand firm for the gospel, people will not like you. They will think you're crazy. Can I get an amen, Patty, from our family? People will think you're crazy. Amen. Not So here's <laughs> So here's the test. Simple test. If you proclaim a message that everyone loves, you can be sure that you are not proclaiming the gospel. If you proclaim and share a gospel that everyone loves, you are not sharing the gospel. The gospel confronts sinners with their rebellious hearts, and the fact is many people take offense, offense to that. I'm not a sinner. How dare you, right? You hear that all the time. What do you mean? I'm good. Or they, or they, they play the dead person card. Are you saying my father didn't go to heaven? Yeah. I'm not talking to your father. I'm talking to you. Right? And they try to shift because they really want to think yeah. that good people, there's some line someplace that it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's not. The gospel will bring life and transformation and it will bring glory into, into your life if you follow after Jesus. Right? It brings abundant life. But a lot of people don't want that. They want to be coddled, and they want you to affirm the idol of self in their life. And if we do that, we are not preaching the gospel. The gospel will always humble human pride. It will always humble human pride. It, it, it declares that there's no amount of human goodness that can reconcile us to God. There's nothing we can do that can reconcile us. The gospel shows that they can do nothing to help God in, in redeeming themselves, the gospel says that even moral people with a great amount of human holiness won't make it. There is no right human righteousness that doesn't deserve judgment from God and full wrath from God. So the gospel proclaims, this is what it proclaims, you must repent of your sins and receive the imputed righteousness of Jesus, your only hope for heaven. That's the gospel. You, ha you have to repent. You have to agree with God that your goodness stinketh. It's just, 
and people aren't going to like that message. Um, and let me challenge you because um, it's going to get harder and harder, mm. right? And and the and the, the the challenge will be that as we share the gospel, when we get a little bit of pushback in the past, now we're going to get a lot of pushback, right? And our and our feelings will be to right hands off. Then we can't do that. We have to be. Are we willing? to face the division? Are we willing to face the pushback and the, and the hurt and the pain that comes along with the ministry of the gospel? Our Savior, Jesus, remember him? He clearly taught that if we proclaim and hold to the true gospel, we have to be prepared for division, even among people that we love so, so much. It's going to happen. So here's the application. Just one thing. Jesus coming draws a line that forces us to take sides. The gospel forces you to make a decision one way or the other. There is no holding pattern, right? There is no give me a sec, right? You, you, it, you're confronted with the gospel. You have to make a decision one way or the other. Let me just give this one example, one story. There was a training session for a Soldiers who are about to make their first parachute jump, right? So all these guys are lined up, and the you know the, the command is going over what you do in, in the parachute jump. And if your primary parachute doesn't go off, then you you pull your secondary shoe, right? Your backup shoe. So one of the soldiers asked, you know, Sarge, um, if my primary shoe doesn't open, how long do I have to pull my secondary shoe? And the sergeant said. You have the rest of your life, son. You have the rest of your life. And the point is, we think that's how we run the gospel, right? That we pull the shoe and go, you know, I got time. I got the rest of my life. The problem is, you don't, because you don't know when the rest of your life is going to happen. Yes. The, ground to that, the ground comes up real quick, and you think you have plenty of time to pull the shoe, but you don't. People are like that soldier plunging after the primary shoot didn't work, whatever idea they had of salvation. They confront with the truth, pull the shoot, and they go, how much time do I have? How long can I wait before I have to pull the saving button, right? You have the rest of your life. But you don't know when the rest of your life is. So either you accept Jesus as your sin bearer and be reconciled to God, or you come into God's court of justice and pay the debt on your own. That debt is eternal separation from him. How long do you have? How long do the people around us have to get on the side of Jesus? Choose him. And the answer is always, you have the rest of your life. But there's a warning. If Jesus told parables about, you know, thinking you have plenty of time, you store up things, and you're planning for the rest of your life, and the day comes, and you're shocked. Many people will be shocked. See, that answer is so deceptive because most of us don't think that we could go at any moment. We don't have a guarantee of the next 30 seconds. And people want to have to hand that shoot just in case. People have heard the gospel message. I'll do it on my deathbed. Whatever. You need to decide now. And you need to tell people you need to decide now. And that proclamation of the gospel draws the line that Jesus drew. Life. Death. What are we willing to do to preach the gospel as Jesus preached it? Well, lines will be drawn. Does he deserve that full allegiance? Let's pray. Jesus, this is a, a really a, a sobering message. It, for me personally, God, I, you know, I, I confess that recently I, I can't even think of a person I've actually shared the full gospel with. I've just gotten lazy. And, uh, and God, we get lazy about it. Maybe it's because we just don't like to be hurt and we feel the rejection is rejection of us. Whatever the, the many reasons are, were, uh, God, one of them is, is division. And, and we need to be prepared that this is what the gospel does. It asks people to see who they are in light of who you are. We ask them to, to see themselves as broken, as sinners without hope, and they, they need to repent. They can't rely on themselves. And if they do, they're in trouble. 
And we need to tell them, God, that but you and your mercy and your love understand our predicament. You understand that's how we are. And you provide a way that we can be righteous before you. But if we choose that way, then there's, there's, there's costs. Division happens. We lose friends. We lose family. We, we maybe lose our livelihood. We, there's a number of things, God, that, where that division af- affects us in real practical ways. And God, many of us compromise. I know I have over the years, God. So I pray that you would give us uh, courage with a, in, a, in a biblical way. Courage that, that we see in the scripture where people would stand where others would fail. We want the power of the Spirit to flow through us, God. So that we would proclaim the gospel in its fullness. That we would present life and death. That people would, would sen- sen- sense the aroma uh, of life in the gospel and, and, and turn away from that which would lead them to separation and death. God, give us power through your spirit to do the things that are beyond our power. God, give us boldness. Give us discernment and wisdom um, to, to know when to open our mouths and, and present with, with uh, the fullness of the gospel or just to, to plant seeds here and there. God, we need just strategies, especially as our world changes so quickly, it seems. Things not just in our country, but around the world are changing. Your church is changing. And, and lines are being drawn, God. And, and um, whether this is heading towards the end or whether your coming is delayed thousands of years, the point is we live in the now. And God, we need to reach the, the generation that you've placed before us. So God... Um, Whatever it takes, God, we give ourselves to you, that your gospel would be proclaimed with boldness and clarity, and that you would be glorified in all these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.